Let's start by going back. Tell me what you consider, and we'll go around the table here, the key elements. What were the things that were necessary in order for desktop publishing to be economically, technologically viable, business case viable in the 1980s? What did you have to have in place? Let me just start around. Chuck, do you have any thoughts on what you think were the key elements? One was the concept of the mathematical description of character outlines. Because uh, as Xerox, as uh, Liz Cruz pointed out, they were originally making bitmaps, and this was the way, or <coughs> rasterized elements. This is a font issue. Is a font issue. Paul? Well, laying the foundation for the microcomputer, taking the mini computer and miniaturizing it, and the whole concept around Intel and creating the mass storage devices that went with it and so forth. But we needed the, that 100x breakthrough itself, in hardware. Yeah. What you're saying is that having a machine of that size and cost Correct. was critical to yes. making this economically feasible. Correct. Understand. Liz, some thoughts? Yeah, I, um, I think that it was critical to have a page description language that allowed uh, people to have an opportunity to have device in independent output and to also be able to do think beyond the size of an eight and a half, eight and a half by 11 inch piece of paper. And if you didn't have a page description language that allowed you to do that, you really weren't going to be able to publish serious pieces. Good third element. Mm -hmm. And I'm Donald? usurping probably what John and Chuck would have to say. Donald? Well, I guess uh, just the fact that digital uh, would be able to make a decent looking output uh, was, uh, was key. Any thoughts? I think user interfaces, user interfaces were important, not just, I mean, systems for computer scientists. Okay. Um, it's what I was going to say. I was doing desktop publishing on my Apple II by 1985 or 86, and I was 14 years old. Steve. You think some of the key elements are? Hmm. You were obviously engaged elsewhere. Uh, the question is, what were the things, the fundamental building blocks that we needed to have in place in order to do desktop publishing in the 80s? What were we doing, needed to do in the 70s to make that uh, feasible? Um, personalized access, easy, easy access. Um, so affordable hardware, you know, essentially a a, a you know, PC that could do WYSIWYG that you have a, you could print it out. Um, uh, you had uh, disk drives uh, that could store enough information. Uh, and, uh, and networking, you, you're able to communicate the, so all of those were in place. I'd say the graphical operating system so that you had a core set of functionality that the app didn't have to recreate from scratch um, each time whether it was access to fonts or high quality printing devices or screens, mouse input, menus, dialogues, all that stuff. That was, it was hard to do an app when you had to do all of that, which is really operating system layer stuff plus your applications. So it left, it left things easier for the app writers. Um, <clears throat> laser printers that a single person could lift and move. <laughs> that seems to be a very critical element. How about you, John? Uh, communication infrastructure, the, the growth of the ARPANET during the 70s was really important. The, uh, the Alto style machine uh, was ambitious for its time, but as the later machines at PAR came along, like the Dorado and the Dolphin, wasn't it? Uh, you got color, and that forced the device independent issues to come to the surface. So black and white versus color you think was a significant element? Or is that something separate? Not at the super beginning, but it obviously was a place where the industry had to go. Uh, I think the software user interfaces, the mouse, the keyboard, the ability to interact with the screen, you had to have all of those components. And when we started Adobe, I mean, Sun Microsystem really was the only game in town that was starting to build terminals, but they were very expensive. Look, basically, as John Skull said this morning, you needed all the things that we built at Park in the 70s, and you, you needed them to be commercially available 
at a reasonable cost. And the only thing I would add to that is what John just said about color, which we made a very explicit decision not to do it for because we thought it would be too expensive. So to me, it's the ubiquity for a variety of technical and economic reasons of raster imaging for input and output, and it, which happened to have the lovely consequence that it was oblivious to the content that you were imaging. So it could be images, it could be pictures, could be drawings, could be text, could be whatever. It was up to the resolution of the renderer and, of course, your eye. And, and at, when I said economic, what I mean is that there's a reason that raster is cheaper than calligraphic, and eventually that dominated, and the products and so forth followed, and that was in a very central piece of the infrastructure of all of this. David? Um, I don't, I, all, you, all of you know more about the commercial de desktop uh, publishing world, but I think we were doing desktop publishing in our primitive sense way back as soon as we got to sit interactively at computers or computer terminals. So I think there was a cultural change which had a long time coming and also needed to be supported by all the hardware that the various people have, been, have mentioned. But the whole idea that an individual should get to use a computer. Um, yeah, so I think people have identified all the, the obvious technological prerequisites and I'd be curious to think if we could pin it down more specifically maybe with, um, say, a megabyte of memory and an 8 megahertz 16-bit processor. Um, but pulling back slightly, let's not also forget um, we need to have a community of users out there who want to do their own page layout, who are interested in doing it, and who can afford to buy the technology. And, and remember also all the kinds of infrastructure and cultural work that would go into constructing a new application category. Right, say the work of um, magazines and evangelists in propagating it, the, the labor of producing the phrase desktop publishing. I don't know, did any of you come up with it? Where does, where does that come from? Uh, Good point. And, um, you know, so, so spreading the concept and building the demand for it is also just as important as so having those technological view, building blocks. <clears throat> I'd probably step on, you know, move that forward, that part of the discussion. Uh, I think we've already talked about the product, the technology underpinnings, but I think what was also needed, and I think the, what came out of Xerox and the whole graphical user interface started to permeate, and the Mac obviously took it the next step, the Lisa before it, next step. So that coupled with the, the democratization of it in that there's actually a sales channel to be able to bring it to the masses, and, but the price and ease of use had to be there. So it's, it's, again, everything has to come together. And once it all came together so it could get out to people, you know, at a price that they could afford in a transformative way, then you had a chance to really have something explode. Harry? I think we've named a lot of technologies and we talked about when they all came together. Uh, and it could be, there's two ways to interpret that. One is, oh, by just coincidence, they all got finished the same day and so we started a new industry. Uh, it, there were several parts already pretty far along and other parts that weren't very far along at all. And there were people who had some need or that or vision that could see, well, if we just can get that done, uh, if we can get a reliable, affordable, light, lightweight laser printer, for example, uh, then we could have the whole thing. And so a lot of people were aware that we were getting really close and uh, somehow, uh, and this, is, this could be where uh, Siebel publications and conferences come in. Uh, this is where, this could be where <coughs> Engelbart's demo, which opened everybody's eyes, you know, kind of came in. Uh, that, that's, that is another oh. way to look at it. I don't have much to add, but just a data point of this awareness thing. In 1976, the pop electronics issue came out with the Altair 8800 on it that inspired Bill Gates and Paul Allen. I heard about that. I had to drive all around San Jose to find a copy of Pop Electronics, 1976, even though these guys are over there in their lab with their alters. And of course, a decade later, you know, people would open up their wallet and, and buy this stuff. So you can sort of see this, this awareness, you know, the, the, the sort of the fear factor of computing dissipating over that period. It's subcultural. This has been a very good list of the prerequisite stuff. 
uh, that you had to have. Uh, let me just sort of talk about what happened, I think. Um, you had what had come out of Xerox Park, and, and that embodied most of the platform we're talking about here. Uh, but there were two key things on top of that that I think pushed things over, made the difference. Um, first was PostScript. The PostScript was absolutely revolutionary because it was device independence and because it dealt with text and graphics. It dealt with the entire, uh, the entire page, if you will. Uh, you know, we didn't get to full high quality color images yet, but that was going to come. But uh, so, Early in this process, um, I'm, I don't know, I don't recall the exact date. Steve Jobs called me and said he wanted. Don't, to don't tell the story okay. now. No, but, but the, uh, another piece. But the story is crucial because because what was missing at that point was there was no software that would take advantage of what PostScript and the Mac could do. None. There was none in development except for one package, and that was PageMaker, because that came out of the newspapers. That came out of a tradition where you needed to do text and graphics. You needed to do page layout. And so when S Steve and John and Chuck first showed me a laser writer, and I told them, you've turned publishing upside down, the missing piece, the missing piece with the software. And I knew all the stuff that was going on pretty much, and the only package that would, that would actually take advantage of that was PageMaker, which is why I told Apple you need to, to talk to, to Aldous, and Aldous you need to talk to Apple, because, because that was the, the key There was a synergy thing that you were Exactly. To. Okay. Richard? I'll uh, channel my partner, Doug Drain. Mm -hmm. uh, not much mm -hmm. point listening to a software guy. Uh, he, told, he said that the, uh, in the 70s, my job is to make sure that the uh, human people, uh, the editors and reporters, will use the computer to type, uh, you know, to do their work, to type their stories in. And he said the, dif the difference is that when you type on a typewriter, you pull the paper out, you fold it up, you put it in your pocket, and you own the story. You don't have the device with you that is necessary to read your story back. He said you have to give them enough other benefits for them to want to use Point. a computer. So I think that, that uh, all of the technologies that we have talked about was enough to tip over the, uh, the hesitancy of release, relinquishing your work, your artistic output, into a machine that you can't rip out and put in your pocket. All right. That's a hell of a list. And one of the things I wanted to have on record here was exactly this. Some other things may come up in our later discussion, but this is a framework of all the pieces. And it was amazing. You know, sometimes it took longer than I would have thought because you don't have your first successful businesses in the software side for the general market other than newspapers until, what, mid-'80s, right? Hardware was too expensive until then. So you were saying the hardware was the key issue. Interesting. Let's now, who wants to tell me about the Engelbart uh, who, who was there? I don't know. I'm asking. <laughs> then you're, you're, you're elected, gentlemen. Which one of you wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a Damon and Pythias kind of thing. Bob Sproul, so, so you're going to start. I, I can't do justice to this. You need to talk to Alan Kay. And by the way, you, <laughs> and by the way, you have. We I mean, don't have time for we, that. We don't. <laughs> but, but it's all on record on video that uh, the Computer beautiful. Museum Thank owns. You. So I really don't think we should, we should go over it. It didn't have a lot to do with publishing, per se. Of the themes we've talked about, it was much more about hypertext or, and communication among people, and especially enabling teams to work together, which, by the way, is another thing we haven't said much about, whether it's a publishing team in a newspaper or a, a team putting together technical documentation. Um, it used interactive, absolutely. It used the mouse. Um, it it uh, uh, had interactive displays. They were not all that pretty, but nothing was in those days. Um, but it was a tour de force in, compared to what most people in the audience were able to use in the way of computers at the time, both in terms of interaction and what it was being used for and uh, the potential. I mean, I think everybody seeing that demo 
imagine their own future about what computers would be like. If there's one thing that it didn't dwell on perhaps as much as it should have is, is and, and perhaps this is a, an uncharacteristic Eng Engelbart modesty, but he didn't say, by the way, you know, the way the technology's going, this is all going to be much cheaper. Even if he didn't predict Moore's law or tell everybody that we were well on the way, perhaps he could have imagined that the reason it was going to be very important is it was all going to get cheap. That, that's certainly what we thought at Park. I mean, we, we used to say that we were building time machines. Um, we were building things that were going to be <laughs> commercially viable 10 years in the future and we were building them today because there was an enormous amount to learn about how to write the software and design the user interfaces and, and all those things that are relatively independent of the cost of the hardware. Um, and an interesting proper thing about that was brought to mind by, by what um, Bob said was, it's absolutely true that the two things that Doug Engelbart thought were most important about the online system were the hypertext-like links and the teamwork and neither one of those things played a significant role at par. On just two footnotes, um, you know, Bill English had to invent a display system to make the NLS visible to the thousand best computer scientists at the time. And it was Bob Taylor who sort of knew that that had to happen and uh, underwrote the invention of that display system to make it possible for people to see it. And also, Engelbart should get credit for understanding the importance of, of scaling and cost. He gave a paper in the 1960, a 1960 conference where he laid out essentially Moore's law before Moore did. One thing that hasn't been mentioned that also occurred at Park at this time was the iconic display for how you work with the interface on a computer and affect the early precursor of Windows and all of that was done as part of the small talk group. And while we don't necessarily factor it in because small talk had, didn't become it, it was really what motivated Jobs and other people to understand what the display interface could look like. Could could, could somebody from Park talk about the usability lab in John, El Segundo? Jonathan. Okay. 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 Paul. Yeah. I don't have the answer to this question, but there was one other development that I saw at, at the Walker Art Center in this time frame. It was the University of Illinois and Plato and it went through iterations over the years. And I saw Plato 4, it was a 512, 512 matrix um, plasma display with 16 IR points with a stylus. Um, it had a lot of different elements, but approaching the problem from a different point of view. And then CDC took it over and eventually it died sometime in the 80s, a slow death. But I, I just wanted to mention that because I think there's more to that visual interface story than necessarily just Xerox Park. What, what you're telling me, I'll get back to the minutes, is that the demo motivated people, saw things, and got a vision that wasn't there before. Is, is that essentially what you're saying? Was that critical to the mission of uh, Xerox Park? It was what critical? If you stopped talking to the side things, you wouldn't be listening. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we say seriously, no side talk. Uh, the, the question was really one of to what extent did the Engelbart demo affect the direction that Xerox took or that other people took? Did it motivate them or simply give them some tools they could use? Oh, it didn't give them tools, it was motivating. It was a motivator. So there were some, some other people from Engelbart's group came to work at Park. They were not terribly central in what went on, but they were there. We also owned one of the workstation machines that had NLS running on it as a, as a self-contained, I've forgotten what it was, but it was sitting in one of the corner offices never used, but it had a key set and a mouse sitting there to remind us, I think, of what, of what NLS was. And I think the NLS ideas were certainly discussed. Um, there were many people at the lab who were familiar with NLS and its demo. And don't forget, they were just across the valley. I mean, there was a fair amount of traffic back and forth. Well, most of the team was working at Park. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. What's fascinating, again, is by being physically close, a lot of the work ended up here in this area, for years that a lot of the software development was just national software products had no focus, just there wasn't any. When we were doing all our work there, people were all over the country. And uh, here, this became a nexus for this whole area. And it came. One, one comment about the Engelbart uh, demo. I, I was a, a 
student and teaching assistant in typography at the San Francisco Art Institute at the time. I didn't go to the demo, I hadn't heard it, and when I did hear it, it was motivational. I remember what I said, uh, it's the 60s, remember? And I said, far out, man, that's groovy. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Taylor was head of ARPA, and there were like tw 20 ARPA sites, something like, something that. like that. And the best computer scientists in the world were at those sites. He came to Utah for about a year, and then he took the job at Xerox to form the lab at Xerox Park. And he cherry-picked every good student out of the whole ARPA community. That's why the concentration of software was at Xerox Park. I mean, he literally cherry-picked people off of the best graduate students from all the best universities from all over the country. Carnegie Mellon, MIT, Harvard. I mean, you know. I guess I don't think there was an engineer in CSL that wasn't an ARPA product. Here you speak. Right? There wasn't an engineer at CSL or SSL that wasn't an ARPA product I can remember. that we can remember. So, the, well, Ron Ryder. Ron, yeah, Ron. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Taylor also cherry picked managers and employees of other companies. I guess the key is Jonathan shows a whole path going through the news newspaper world. That was not the Xerox Park path. And yet, that did, the ATEX comes from that. Okay, that's, uh, I'm, I'm separating the platform from the application software. The platform was the path that came through Park. The application software for desktop publishing is the path that came through newspapers. There are two parallel paths. There's another piece to this Park path, which I think is really, really important, we haven't talked about. And that was the user interface. People seem to still have the concept that I can dream up a user interface out of my head and I can implement it and it's gonna work. <laughs> and it doesn't work that way, okay? Um, I, I think Steve Jobs got people to think that one person can do it and, and for m most mortals that's not true. I, I'd like one of you to talk about how the, the uh, define, operate, uh, object-oriented system came about and what was done in terms of user testing. Now, how do we get to the current our current user interface metaphor that we still have. Do any testing, Larry? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I think they just thought it up out of their heads. But it's actually a very interesting story because when we did Bravo, we made a deliberate decision that we weren't going to work on the us user interface. Not because we didn't think it was important, but because we thought it was hard and we didn't have the resources. So we, we, we kind of hacked together a UI. Uh, the on only thing we did that was careful was we isolated it into one module. And then we were very fortunate that Larry and Tim Mott came along, and they needed an engine, and they wanted to work on UI. So they tore out our module and put their own stuff in. Well, this is exactly where you want to go. So he uses the word platform. Do you view the work at Xerox Park as providing a platform or as providing the software? A, a very universal what? platform. Yeah. I mean, a very, the very... Software is the platform. Yeah. No, it's not. Oh, yes. oh, yes, it is. <laughs> Tell me why. <laughs> because if you require that everyone think of themselves as programming from a naked piece of hardware, and you're going to build everything from the ground up, good luck. Not many people know how to do that. But if you give them layers of abstraction that they can work on top of, then you, in fact, have the beginnings of a real industry. Most of the manpower part went into software, not into hardware. But stop with me. We have, he talks about the importance of, of PostScript. He talks about the importance of PageMaker. We talk about the FrameMaker. These were the programs that actually ended up running and selling. And the platform, I always thought of the things that were underneath but, that. But separate. But I mean, Paul, I, I just yeah. let time. Go. Paul did not build the user interface on top of which he implemented PageMaker. That was part of the Apple world, right? So you're backing Jonathan's statement that the software has a different path and comes a different route than the platform on which all that software I think, is. I think we're yeah. defining platform we're in de several different it ways wrong. here. Yeah. I mean, there's like hardware platform, and that's, that's one thing. And then at the software platform, you have the operating system layer, and all, the graphical user interface ends up in the operating system layer. 
So anyone who, like Paul writing PageMaker or us writing Ventura or Steve writing FrameMaker, depending upon what operating system you're writing on top of, you've got to write all of, you just call into the functions that are already there. So when you say platform, graphical user interface is part of the platform, but it is software. I absolutely agree yeah. because all my applications that I built were built on these platforms that all the guys up in Poughkeepsie and the other place had constructed. So the question is, is the primary work then at Xerox Park to build that high level system software platform on which the applications could be built? It influenced all the other yeah. platforms that came yeah. later. Came yes. later. So yeah. everything yes, that I'm Apple did in the Apple OS, Windows OS, all of those of things are just clones of <laughs> what came out of Xerox Park. But, but this is a but. gross oversimplification because you can't engineer the platform properly if you don't have the apps. I mean, we didn't have an, an app like PageMaker, but we had a lot of other apps. That, and there was constant interplay back and forth between the fundamentals provided by the OS and the graphics and, and the fonts and all that, and the demands of the application, of what, what the application writers thought they needed and what the users had to say about what the applications were good for or not good for. This is why, for example, we didn't do spreadsheets at Park because we had no customers for them. Uh, um, I, I'm not sure I look at this correctly, but uh, uh, in a way, um, in the 70s, if you, if you try to make a rank-ordered list of the top 100 software people in the world, the people who, who, who were able to make computers do tricks the most, in, in the best way, uh, you would find that maybe out of the out, out of the top ten, there would have been there would have been five of them at Xerox Park. Out of the next ten, there would have been seven of them at Xerox Park. Out of the next ten, nine, and after that, ten, 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 ten. I mean, it was it it was incredibly cream of the crop. Uh, 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 as you say, Bob Taylor built it. Now, on the other hand, when you have such brilliant people working, they aren't necessarily the best people to, who's going to make a, a a program that's usable by by your your cousins uh, and and so it that takes a completely different kind of skill go ahead Bob. so would you allow me a few minutes to say a few things about what we actually did at park around the imaging area because despite your comment I don't believe much has been written about the details. Yes, they know about you know, the, the, the input-output, you know, the printing, the this, the that, but not perhaps much about the decisions that were made. As Butler announced this morning or said in his little introduction, we weren't building publishing systems. We weren't even really building imaging systems. We were trying to do experiments on organization of office information systems. Um, and it was clear that graphics was going to play a role in that. Um, and when I got to Park in Christmas 72, Gary Starkweather had the first uh, laser scanner of a page a second printer going. Ron Ryder was building a, a character generator design that Butler, I think, was heavily behind in order to drive that at 500 bits per inch a page a second. That was a fairly tough row at the time to hoe. It was controlled by a Nova, Data General Nova, sitting on the network or what paused the MCA network, if you can remember that. But we it was clearly going to, as Butler said, have to be a server. Um, this, this, for me, set a, an important image about what we had to be working on. There were going to be printers of various different kinds, different sizes, different speeds. We it clearly could do only what the character generator could generate on that printer. We couldn't do graphics. There were some elaborate hacks that I won't bore you with, but they were hacks to generate things that looked like graphics by creating very special purpose fonts. Um, so one of the things that William Newman and both of us with backgrounds in interactive graphics, device independent software packages for line drawing displays and so on, we put together this design called Press, which was device independent. It was an attempt to cater for text and line graphics, area graphics, and halftones. The whole thing we thought we could within a stretch of imagination, convert to print on a raster display. And when you talk about platform, by golly, that was a piece of the platform. So several people, myself included, went off and started working primarily on software to print that format at various different speeds, different color, different precisions, what have you. Other people went off and said, you know, there's other pieces of this ecosystem that have to be put together, like fonts. Patrick Baudelaire 
We had our spline expert in Bob Flagel, so we chose to use regular splines, not yet uh, Bezier curves, even the Utah guys have been experimenting with them, but they had not, with, to us, the fact that they had a superior user interface property had not yet been demonstrated. We made the wrong choice there, but at least the, we chose cubic outlines. I remember, Don, I actually came and talked to you about that choice, and you tried to talk me out of it in favor of, you know, your, your uh, more stroke-oriented scheme. But frankly, we, were, we knew how to do scan conversion. We knew how to do scan conversion from curves and actually do it without glitches. And we were interested in getting on with the printing experiments, and so we chose to use outlines. Um, and then, on the, again, on the source area, you know, as you know, there were programs for do, as Butler was saying, there were apps, simple ones, because don't forget, we only had a 64K 16-bit machine when we started. So these were things to make line drawings. These were things to do um, bitmap drawings by hand. Think of them as early paint <coughs> programs. They were in black and white markup. The draw was the line drawing program done by Patrick Baudelaire. Um, and we experimented with color. Um, one of uh, Liz's associates at XEOS, Dale Green, had the best xerographic machine on the planet at the time. He not only understood the xerography, but he, he captured all the huge, great uh, scanning uh, uh, resources as well. So he had a 768 bit per inch four color machine. Uh, and as William and Newman and I, as, well, as, as we were doing the second edition of our book, we decided to use all of these tools as a sort of stress test. So we used Pub from, uh, from Larry, which had been modified to produce press files as text output. We used Markup for doing some of the bitmap stuff. We used Draw for all of the line drawings. There's not a single line drawing in the book that is not done with Draw. Many thanks to Heichon Sargent, who did almost <laughs> all the work. Um, and we wrote programs to combine it all and do the page composition, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and then printed them on Dale's machine, all in black and white, at high as high resolution as we could on hard surface paper. And despite what you said this morning, they simply made offset films from those pages directly. Oh, you had this really cool printer. We did have a cool <laughs> printer, but we were not foolish enough to do halftones this way. The halftoning that you did for a Xerox machine was quite different than what you did for an offset machine. And there was no way we were going to make halftone dots on Dale's machine that had the right shape for an offset printer. So we just, that was done with X-Acto knives. We didn't do that. <laughs> that was the one thing we, uh, we, we surrendered. So, but this was, and, and I have to say, it, again, a, the little piece of the desktop publishing story here that, that, that I think may be interesting is what we discovered in doing it this way with all of this sort of hodgepodge of tools. And by the way, these were all experimental tools. None of them were products. They were still supported by their authors who were still alive and thankfully available to us to uh, make changes. And we did a lot of hacking ourselves. But the message of was a book Producing a book is not, you know, a newsletter. It is a database publishing activity, and what you have is what today would be called a tool chain that you run. After you make a change to some piece of the book, you re-execute the tool chain, and the changes that you've made are propagated to the final result that you can then inspect before you actually print. So it's more like today's the way software is engineered and modified and released than it is the way you put together a letter to your friend. End of story. Oh, that's very interesting. And, and just one thing to add to that, that some people probably know, but maybe some don't. <coughs> Press, which Bob just referred to, was the prototype for PostScript. So it wasn't that we didn't know that we needed a PostScript-like thing. In fact, we knew that very well, and we had one. Um, I just want to ask Bob, uh, I seem to remember that one of the big mantras at Park at that time was to be the paperless uh, office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this was always a source of some humor. Um, obviously, our bosses didn't want to go paperless. I mean, the, 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 the Webster and eventually Stanford bosses didn't want us to go paperless. I, I, I enjoyed one, one day six sitting next to the Dover at Park, watching all you guys printing up your email. Oh, yeah. So actually, so let me, let me just say one more thing about the Dover, because I meant to mention it, because it was an example of teamwork at Park. So the Alto has about 30 megabits of memory bandwidth. 30 megabits, please, not bytes. 30 megabits. Printing a page a second 
on a 384 bit per inch printer takes 12 megabits per second. And that's just sending the video to the printer. So you don't have much time to do other things. The Alto was never, we never thought could print on a page a second machine, which is what the Dover turned out to be, until we had a meeting one day, and I can still remember this meeting. I can picture it. I know who was sitting in which seat. And I was sitting across from Butler, and Butler was facing the window. And those of you who've ever been in meetings with Butler, he will sometimes get a sort of far away look. He's looking just over your head, and there's something in his hand. It's a, it's a pen or pencil, and he's scribbling, and he's thinking really hard. And Butler made a, a suggestion in this meeting about a simple way that we could build a single board that would plug into an Alto that would drive a page a second machine at 384 bits per inch. Text, on, text and rules, horizontal and vertical lines we could do. <laughs> um, and Severo Ornstein and I went off and did the hardware and software and made it work. And that's what, that's what became Dover's. It was, an, it was an otherwise vanilla Alto. Just a minute, John. Two quick things, if I may, Don, on, on your point about the printing volume and so on. One of the stories we used to tell to reassure the rest of the corporation was that we had the data from Park on how the volume on the copiers went way down, but that the volume on the printers went up to more than offset it, and therefore the total <laughs> amount of page of paper that came in the loading dock was greater than it would have otherwise been, and therefore all those copier guys should relax. We're going to have lots of ways to sell toner. So. Yes, very <laughs> The other point I'd like to make, and, and these guys did even much more of it than I did, but it, we have to be a little careful about you know, the Xerox platform or the result from Xerox. It was a very iterative process over a number of years, and the blessing that I took away from it is that the cycles were very quick. Because we were an industrial research center, we weren't depending on annual research contracts from somebody else, and if you didn't like something, you could go talk to somebody and have a conversation over a cup of coffee and fix it. So the Alto comes up as a, as a text-oriented interface to the exec. That's all there is. And then somebody writes Neptune, which is a finder-like, but not with icons. So it has point and click to file names, but it has no icons. And then you get Smalltalk that has icons, and the graphics include Markup and Sill and Fred and Icarus, and printing formats that go from ears to press to Inner press. Did Jam ever get built, John, or was that? We know. printed from it. Yeah. yeah. And so, and 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 I could barely reconstruct all of these pieces, except it was a furious pace of iteration. So it's really hard to sort of say, oh, this did that. I mean, somebody would see a feature in Gypsy, and it would show up somewhere else, and then oh, wait a minute, you know, you look at the software catalog, and you know, every month there's a new thing. Oh, this got released, and this got fixed, and. You know, Fred just got went from seven bits to eight bits in the coding and everything. So it, it, it there isn't a, a single thing that I think of as the platform. I think there's a paradigm that emerged, and you get to the end, you get all of this, and it all looks easy. But at the time, it was a free for all. Thank you, John. <laughs> the so, so let's here again. You're doing what you imagine might be the office of the future. Is that a fair statement? How many of you he, were here are from? We're in Xerox Park sometime during the 1970s. Jonathan, Larry, working or visiting? Working. Anything? No, no, uh, working or, 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 or knew what was going on. No, no, working there. Oh, okay. One, two, three, four, five. John, six. Was unpaid consultant. No. Liz, Liz no, the one behind you. Yes. And, <laughs> and thank you. So, so you were all there and part of this process. Does publishing as such? drive you at all as an application area, or is that simply uh, something that happened, or you saw happening? Because I don't think of an office as Absolutely. Being a, absolutely. Now I got a, I got a head that's shake. Because that's part job. of what an office does. Pardon? But an office doesn't publish, it prints. It well, does. it prints. Tell me, but <laughs> tell me. Liz, come on. Publish is just a way of getting money back for it. Just a minute. <laughs> tell me, Liz, an what office. it is. An office publishes all the time. What does it publish? It publishes its marketing materials. It uh, publishes its annual reports. It publishes its presentations. It's it's a publisher. It's a good point. Now the question that. is, what happened? How did I, as an individual, become a publisher? That's what was really the secret about desktop publishing. What You're motivated me as an individual to really want to be a publisher, to do my newsletters, to do my, and. 
I think that will come up later with Paul, mm -hmm. that uh, the market in the 80s was a little different than what the original market cons concept, we'll get to that later. Yeah, that's a that very later. good point you just made, Liz, that that's, that changes my way of viewing what you were trying. I always thought of you sort of, we, we were using those big printers to run all this stuff, and you were looking for the next stage of that, and that wasn't it. The, the early adopters uh, were horrible amateurs. Uh, they used every font on every page. Uh, their, design, <laughs> their design skills were negative. negative. <laughs> but they didn't understand about fonts or topography or spacing or layout or all of those things. But they were enthusiastic, and the people who did do those, like all the magazines at the time, said, voila. I can reduce my budget by a bajillion dollars because by doing this myself. See, I guess I'm trying to see is there somewhere in there is this change, switch over from an office as sort of an entity and you just do what you do to making it something that you as an individual can do. And that seems to be the massive mm -hmm. change in the picture when we get to the 80s. So, oh, okay. It's always individual. Yeah, it's always. That we needed all this apparatus, <laughs> organizational and structural apparatus, uh, to early to in enable the, the early, early in Adobe, we wanted to make every person on earth a master builder, that they could do everything themselves. Are you, you had a comment you wanted to add to that? Yeah. Um, there's several. <laughs> I have to pick one here. Um, the, the one thing to remember is that Xerox Park owned Park and funded Park, and Xerox was at one point around that time uh, second largest company by market cap in the U.S. and was in the top ten for many years. Uh, if if uh, Xerox was going to be looking at the office of the future, this was going to be an office with printing. There's no no doubt about it. And uh, when somebody from Park walked into a client to <laughs> interested in running uh, uh, an experiment of some kind, the reaction was, you're from Xerox, the printing company, basically, and uh, that was just a natural fit. Vincent, did you have a comment you want to make? Sorry, I just wanted to hear um, Larry talk more about GIN and, um, and the work, how GIN drove the development of Gypsy. So I joined Park in February uh, 1983, no, 70, 73, yeah. February 73. And uh, what I only partially hid from everybody was that I was not in so interested in the office of the future, I was more interested in the print shop of the future. And I tried to get myself on projects about that, and there weren't any at that point. Uh, and um, so I got roped into spending some of my time on the Office of the Future and some on just general visioning of, uh, of technology. And then, by surprise, uh, just as I was at the point of maximum disappointment that this wasn't <laughs> working out the way it should, uh, there was, uh, my boss called me in Bill English and said, uh, we've been contacted by Ginn and Company in Lexington, Massachusetts, uh, Xerox acquired them a few years ago, and they're paying a little tax, just like every other uh, Xerox division, paying a little tax to the company to fund the research center. And they're not seeing anything being done there that would help them. So he tried to explain how it, we have Alan Kay education software for their textbooks and so on, but they weren't buying it. They wanted to see products in the, in the pipeline, and, and uh, they didn't even care about the research part of it. They, they came to find out how they were going to get products uh, that they could use in the preparation of, of their textbooks. So I thought, wow, this is an opportunity. And uh, Bill sent me and a few others to Lexington, spent a few days there studying what they did, ended up hiring uh, somebody named Tim Mott, became famous for other things later, but uh, he um, uh, got a job at Ginn 
working with Park as the person to work with Park. And he was a uh, very good software engineer and very good usability person. Um, so all of a sudden, there was an official project at Park that was about publishing, about the publishing industry. And, uh, and the people involved in it uh, grew. The um, uh, usability people uh, were hired uh, from uh, as Tom Moran and Stu Card, uh, who were hired, uh, uh, who had just gotten their PhDs from Carnegie Mellon, uh, and Alan Newell, who uh, was their uh, advisor, uh, we became very interested in making sure that the products that were built out of these park technology uh, were usable, just to make a simple statement out of it. And uh, so that answered some well, of those the questions that have come up. So many pieces. That's my problem here is time. We've got, I have a list here of just odds and ends. The font design work, obviously significant. I think there was a tie-in with Mergenthaler at one point. Was that with Xerox Park? Did you guys work with somebody else? No. There? We first worked, or at least I think I can say to that, uh, when the Xerox Corporate Font Center was first uh, founded to help develop fonts for the 9700 printer and that the electronic printers at that time, we were developing 300 DPI fonts, literally bitmaps. And um, the, um, the actual development staff there was very taxed because it was primarily being used for the insurance industry. And the, uh, the boilerplate was then added to specific data that had to be put in. And I would get, we would get request to take, uh, bastardize the universe font into a fixed pitch font. And we would, we made a thousand versions of them because somebody had designed a form that wanted literally this many characters per inch and that many characters per inch. And it was just overbearing because we just kept regurgitating the same thing and bastardizing universe and Helvetica and, until we got them fixed pitch fonts. And in addition to that, uh, it was very important to have the real rights to Roman PS and Courier. And so we negotiated the contracts for that. And, and, and it occurred, I think, to us here that there was going to be more need for additional typefaces because the insurance industry wasn't the only one that was going to adopt the electronic printers. And so I went off to Mergenthaler Linotype particularly um, and asked them if they would help us literally make 300 DPI fonts. So we negotiated a contract with Mergenthaler Linotype to build and make 10 typeface families for Xerox. There was some connection mm -hmm. there. Some and so those 10, we literally purchased those. Uh, and uh, Mergenthaler and ITC particularly were questioning whether or not they could build how many, how many point sizes could we build? Could we build a nine point, uh, 11 point, 12 point? Um, I'll never forget Ed Ronthaler at ITC literally taking a typeface design and literally making a bitmap of it to show me what it would look like at nine point. And so the, we divided or decided on 10 type sizes, and we literally had Mergenthaler create so those for this us. This taught us the lesson that if we were going to do printing technologies as we had envisioned, we would have to hire a monastery of people <laughs> to make bitmaps. It was and that wasn't going to work. Okay. <laughs> so we clearly had to apply a new technology to that. So the raster technology comes in? And that and that's where, frankly, at Xerox, we never got to that point where we actually had outline technology that was usable in a printing device. And that's probably the key inventive thing that helped launch Adobe. When, when, when we started Adobe, we didn't know how to do it. We had no idea how to do it. What we did know is that we either solved this problem or we would go out of business. 
You understand what the, what the issue is? The issue is that if you rasterize an outline font in a stupid way at a low resolution like 300 dpi, the result looks crappy. So the stem, no the one, would, it, no one would accept it. If you do the letter M, the, the, the middle time. stem will be thick yeah. and the two side stems will be thin. Well, I was just going to say, and, and by the way, you know, our, our park fonts were just there to get barely legible characters on the page. Every printer we had distorted those one way or another. And, and, and compensating for xerographic effects, which essentially is one of the device dependence issues, was a key thing that we did not attack at all. The other thing that... Oh, just a second. Jonathan. Let's throw one more thing on the fonts. To compound problems, the screen resolution was less than the printer resolution. Oh, absolutely. And so you end up with this anomaly oh, yeah. in uh, where you where you have look hard copy on the screen and the type goes like yes. this as yes. hard as possible to read. Oh, yes. Okay, because when you try to make the screen match up with the printer, it looks terrible. Yes, sir. And if you make the printer match up with the screen, it looks terrible. Yes, sir. Much worse. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing I'd add that we discovered is that when you start working with typographers and type designers, you realize very quickly that typography requires additional character sets that were not available on the regular keyboard. And so it was really imperative that we literally work on with the standardization committee so we could standardize where the uh, qu double quotes Lips. words the ligatures are going to be stored, and all the other additional characters, and in addition to that, copyright symbols, registered mark symbols, and et cetera. Then we address the issue of foreign languages, okay, and accented characters. And so there was an enormous amount of effort that had to be put in at that same time as we were developing the typefaces so that we could make sure we had the designs that would allow people to be able to print in multiple languages but you were still and stuck with the bitmaps you're telling yes, us. That's right. That's and so right. in, in, in the, when we get to the 1980s, we'll tell you the fascinating story <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> how that was fixed. <laughs> get there. I'm staying with the 70s. Did you have a comment, Paul? I just want to make sure before we finish the 70s that Jonathan and I have a chance to, to oh. talk about the newspaper publishing industry because just making sure we're... I promise we will not. Okay. We may give up the 80s, but we will finish the 70s. Yeah, there's no question that Xerox and Park and all that frame the technology and the vision. However, start that now. Why don't you go for it? Like, like go we, for it. Can we can we start the newspaper now? Oh. Okay. Okay. But three more questions, and then we'll do it. Okay. So font design, laser <laughs> the laser printer. You all said that was critical also to this work. Gary Starkweather. Pardon me. Gary Starkweather. And he was. Gary Starkweather was an optical engineer. Uh, worked for Xerox and Webster. Um, don't forget, there was a lot of optics in copiers. Um, and, but he, his, his, he made a key invention about the optics to get a scan line to be, to be uniform width across a wide sp span from a fairly narrow throw. If you wanted to make a throw, you know, 10 feet long, sure, no problem. But you'd have mirrors and mirrors and mirrors, and it would never fit in your in your copier. Uh, and, and then there was a bunch of systems issues too. So for it, so this scan line, so uh, you know, I said it was at a page a second, 300 and, well, you, you can do the math, but they were going pretty fast. You have to synchronize carefully the video you're sending. You have to be able to s detect when that scan line is starting to cross the page and when it ends. And, and the rotating polygon, or I think eight faceted polygons in, the, in ears, so it's going pretty fast. It's not supersonic, so you're not driven out of the room, but near, very nearly. It makes a big screech, or they did early on. And, and there's a bit of wobble. There can be some wobble in the, in the rotor. And so you have, to, you have to synchronize. You have to detect when the scan line passes, when it ends, build a phase lock loop to generate the video signal, and be able to compensate for the various uh, uh, mechanical aberrations that the rotor introduces. Now, over time, the aberrations got better as people designed better and better rotors and so on. The technology improved substantially. But early on, and in fact, you'll still see this in some of the, you can tell a photocopy, well, you can tell early Xerox Park documents because, the, first of all, the scan lines went vertical on the, they went the 11 inch direction. 
and you can see some, a little bit of drifting up and down as you go across the page. Well, that's because we hadn't quite gotten the synchronization circuits to work well with, with the scanner. And making them stable over missing a scan line detection, you didn't want it to go haywire if it missed one, one scan line passing. So getting all that to actually go, that was Gary and Ron Ryder, by and large, who did the circuit and system stuff to make all that work. With slower copy machines, it was easier. Um, but ultimately, that's the technology that was put in the Xerox 9700, which is what Liz was doing all those 300 bit per inch fonts for at two, two pages a second, which was the flagship Xerox printing product that made all this worthwhile as far as the company was concerned. WYSIWYG. That was also, you did the stuff on WYSIWYG there? Yeah. Well, tell me briefly. With the, with the caveat, as I said, that it, that it didn't match very well. <laughs> the screen and the printer didn't, yeah, help, it didn't match very well. Go ahead. <laughs> no, we fudged that. <laughs> yes, sir. And the result was typesetting, which any typographer would consider to be unbelievably crappy. <laughs> <laughs> but it was good enough for us. <laughs> it was a lot better than what you could do with a dot matrix printer. Or the XGP. Or for that matter, the XGP, right. Um, our goal was to make it so that um, you could print, a, at the very least, a beautiful office memo, and then uh, in the not, well, that was the main focus of, of WYSIWYG. Our goal was to make uh, Bravo so that. Better than the typewriter. <laughs> well, <laughs> substantially better than it. So that you could look on the screen and see something where the, you, you had the, the, the beautiful Xerox logo in the beautiful Xerox logo font, and, and it was positioned in the right place, and and you could have other stuff surrounding it in various different fonts and so on. And what you saw on the screen was to the untutored eye of the, <laughs> of the computer engineer rather than the, than the professional publisher. Ah. Uh, it looked just like the printed page. It looked good enough. Close enough. It, it was close level. enough for our purposes. Well, well, for example, you know, the widows were in the same place. The page breaks were in the same place. The indentations were roughly the same. I mean, from the standpoint of layout, as yeah, needed by most office right documents, yeah. it was fine. <laughs> Next. Go ahead, Chair. Um, just quickly, John, or maybe John, why don't you think is, I, I don't remember who, who told me this. It, it might have been uh, Charlie Ying, but, but, but anyway, the, the, there was a question uh, about uh, taking this WYSIWYG type of thing uh, to the people at newspapers who, who set the uh, classified ads? Because that because because that was a huge keyboarding expense mm -hmm. to do. The, you know, m many many pages of a newspaper were classified, and 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 and, and basically the people of newspaper said, I, I don't need this. I know what it's going to look like. Because, you know, I, I know this line is going to be italic and this could you know in center. But 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 what, 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 this is a case where the ordinary user. Uh, can't separate the visual appearance from from the from the content, and so that's why WYSIWYG was was a revolutionary, but, but not for the professionals, but for the ordinary. I wanted to ask a quick question about um, laser printing at Xerox and its patent protection, because it strikes me that Canon quickly, or at least relatively quickly, within a matter of years, gets into this. Uh, Ten years later. Yeah, was, was it that, that long? C80s, yeah. It was about ten years. Well, These what was the this. patent protection like? Was it, you know, well licensed by Xerox? If so let's be clear, Canon made the, the copier engine. Uh -huh. It was Hewlett Packard, and Apple Adobe, and who it, turned and the image into, who turned it into an image engine. Image engine. So, so it's all of the, all the all of the. Output part, all, all the of the output was no, not no, by no. Canon. Oh, I see. So the, the no. essentially the laser part of it was was the work of Hewlett Packard and Apple. I see. Okay. I, I disagree. Oh. Uh, Canon made the laser printing engine, and all of the software architecture right. above right. it was right. from right. Hewlett Packard, right. Adobe, right. and Imogen. Right. And, yeah. and so yeah. is that is that? Yes. Yeah. 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 That's right. Okay. So it's the engine was Canon, and somehow Canon got past the Xerox patents by writing black instead of white may have been one of those methods. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe writing horizontal instead of vertical. I don't, I don't 
think there's anyone in this room that actually knows the facts about this, so we shouldn't speculate. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We'd just be making it up. We can make up all kinds okay. of imaginative things. A few different groups. Which is the way a lot of history is. <laughs> <laughs> but not this history, right? right. <laughs> we try to, to, to tell him what, uh, what, what they should do uh, uh, in, in order to drive it. And and, uh, and 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 after two years uh, of, of frustration, they, they the Canon decided not to, and 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 that's why Im Imogen was founded. Oh, Avo and uh, Gypsy. Comment on that? Can we already tell yeah, that story? I, no, I didn't. Oh. So you talk a little bit about the Mullet West stop. Well, we haven't talked much about that. The Mullet West. Okay, and it, but it relates to. Uh, Bravo and Gypsy, though. Gypsy. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, what Gypsy was technically was Bravo with the user interface module removed and replaced by a different one. And instead of there being uh, two loops, one for capturing characters that are being inserted, the other one for looking at commands that are issued uh, in be after uh, a suitable termination character, uh, the uh, Gypsy only needed one event loop because you were ne you were never in a character mode or a command mode. You were always in the same one mode. When you have one <coughs> mode, you have none. And um, the uh, uh, want me to talk about how I got involved with. Uh, well, so so the the Gypsy innovation, I believe was at Park, especially in the context of publishing with GIN, was the first appearance of a modeless user interface. And that was your doing. Right. Right. And, and more specifically, the use of cut, copy, and paste. Yes. And uh, we had a lot of skepticism, even by me, when we, whenever we started working in the early days on cut, copy, and paste, because it was not a common term in the general population. You had to be in a certain industry to feel comfortable talking about cut and paste. And uh, that all changed to the point where now uh, cut and paste is a much more common term than any of the other terms <laughs> that, that were used. But we were afraid that, the, that ordinary people would consider it way too technical. We were going for a system that people could sit down and start using without even uh, a manual or lessons. But one thing that was obvious to anybody who had been using computers since interaction became possible in the, in the uh, 50s was that there were a lot of modes in application software. And Sorry, what is a mode? A mode is uh, a state that the program gets into and the user gets operating it, gets it into uh, where the uh, behavior uh, of what happens depends on something other than what the user operated, let's say the key that the user type, uh, struck. And uh, it, uh, the way uh, all, app, all text editors were at that point was that if you wanted to search, for example, you would uh, type a, a letter like F for find, you would type in a string of things that you want to match, a query, uh, have a termination character for, the, for that query. And uh, during the typing part of it, when you're saying what to search for, you can again type a letter, the letter F. But the F means something different than it meant, meant the first time. First F meant find, now the the F is one of the content characters that you're searching for. Understand. So people f would forget what mode they were in. They would not hit the key hard enough. They would uh, hit the escape, escape key the prematurely, <laughs> uh, and they'd get themselves in deep trouble for being in the wrong mode. And so I used to say, everybody complains about getting stuck in a mode, uh, but nobody seems to be doing anything about it. And uh, so I sometime around 1968, uh, I decided I'd had enough and I was going to start trying to find ways to remove modes from user interfaces, starting with text editing. And um, 
I'm sorry, you said 68 or did you mean 78? 68. Oh. And what happened was in 68 was not at the uh, conference where uh, Engelbart demoed NLS, but about a week or two later, uh, a consulting client of mine, at, I was consulting at the time, uh, told me that he had heard about this, and he'd missed it also, and, uh, but he arranged for a demo to us at SRI that very day, <laughs> and could I come over right away? And, uh, uh, and um, so we went there, and um, a couple of people sh showed me a video and then demoed, so answered my questions. And I went away going, <laughs> like everybody else, wow, everything's in here, but NLS was the king of modes. <laughs> but it was. <laughs> but it's too complicated. <laughs> and, uh, and the main problem was you were, every, every keystroke uh, put you into a different mode <laughs> other than the typing of a fine string or something. Uh, there were modes you went into and out of, but not on every character. But everywhere else in the user interface, every single character put you in a different mode. And you didn't know what it was. <laughs> So Bert, if, if I can give you one quick example of the, the, this problem. So prior to using Bravo, you would start at the editor on the Novo by typing the word edit. And at various points in my life, I would forget where I was, and I would be in Bravo, I would be in command mode, but I'd sort of be working on something, I'd have a document or whatever, and I'd, and I'd just instinctively type edit. But I was in command mode of Bravo, I wasn't on the exec. So the E would select everything. Uh oh. The D would delete everything. Uh. The I would put you in insert mode, and the T would put a T in. So you'd be sitting there, and hours of work had just evaporated, and your screen was blank, and it's like, what the hell just happened? And this is the victim of being stuck in a mode where your mind isn't where your fingers are. <laughs> now, last that question on this. The last question, and then we're going to switch to we're going to switch okay. to the newspaper oh, yeah. area. Okay. Press and interpress. How significant are they in this process? Totally, it's very important. Right at the heart of it. Speak. Well, uh, as Bob has already very clearly ex uh, explained, the goals with press were essentially identical to what we were hoping to do eventually with PostScript, and before that with Interpress. And the Interpress project started because we got a phone call from uh, the folks working on the Star workstation saying, this is embarrassing, but we haven't been able to figure out how to get to the printer from the workstation. So we've got this document on the screen, and we can't figure out how to print it. And can you help us? <laughs> and so I put together a group with John and Butler uh, and Bob. Jerry uh, Mendelson. Jerry Mendelson down in El Segundo and Brian Reed. And only the two of us were physically in the same place, but everybody else was on the ARPANET. And so we were emailing one another. And we never actually had an all together in person meeting until the day we finished the project. When we finished it, uh, I, we showed it to Xerox and they said, wow. That's fantastic. That's exactly what we need. That will be the Xerox standard for printing. I said, whoa, you know, and we'd only been a lab for like a year, year plus. And so I immediately got an airplane and I flew back to Connecticut to Xerox headquarters and I said, I need a marketing budget because now we have this standard protocol and I need to get out and start talking about it. And they said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. At Xerox, we never talk about our new technologies and products until they're ready to ship. In, in our uh, case, all the machines. Yeah, yeah, everything <laughs> had to be ready to ship. Uh, oh, you so, wanted well, an implementation. Well, uh, <laughs> I said, uh, that's strange, but okay. Uh, how long will it be before you ship? Well, at Xerox, it takes seven years to bring out a product. <laughs> I said, seven years? That's two to three to maybe four generations in the industry you're going into. Somebody else will have done something, doesn't matter whether it's any good or not, they'll have 100% of the market and we'll have none. And I said, sorry, that's the way it is. 
And that's what launched Adobe. <laughs> we are now going to stop the discussion. I'm not. Jonathan and the others who are involved, no. Look, I haven't got to say anything this whole session. I've got a comment that I think will set this up nicely, right? So, pulling together some of the things people have said, I mean, one of the questions has been, right, so we started with the suggestion that maybe the application is coming from newspaper side and the platform's coming from another side. And in terms of the capabilities, right, of a computer being able to produce printed output, that's clearly true. But I think something that's come through in this discussion is that a big crucial part of the platform is the WYSIWYG side. And that makes a difference for the kinds of people who can use it. So as Don said, the people using the newspaper system didn't need it because they could see in their head what a page is going to look like from the tags. But remember, desktop publishing is about you know, the individual who's not a typographer doing it from their desktop. And so one way to think about this, and this goes back to what you were saying about offices do or don't publish, is it's eliminating a kind of work. Right? The individual can publish without needing to go to a print shop full of people who do that for a living, and they could do it directly. So what I would like to see from this discussion that I'm very pleased we're just about to happen is, on the one hand, the WYSIWYG importance is obvious. On the other hand, that newspaper systems published is obvious. What I would love to know is, under the hood, how much of what's going on in terms of fonts and publishing and so on is explicitly guided by the experience that's been built up in the newspaper systems, and how much of it is just a completely independent development? Okay, we, have, we actually have pictures to hand out that go to directly to your question. Um, we didn't hand them out today, so, but we Doug, might want to now. But so, I, so it's the only problem if you hand them out, we're gonna spend the next 20 okay, minutes. Okay, but, but, we, but I, I, we have a set of pictures. Jonathan, just a second. Here's what we'll do. We have these pictures, these wonderful color pictures that were done of the things that were going on in the newspaper publishing during the 1970s. You all can pick up copies on your way out, study them in great depth this evening, and uh, talk about them maybe a little bit tomorrow. But I, uh, I'll give you a hint. You will see PageMaker. You'll see the page outline. You'll see the text on the screen. You'll see PageMaker in those pictures. Okay. So um, let me just set some stuff and we'll let Paul and and Richard talk about this stuff. Just to set the background for what's happening parallel to Park, we have this automation of newspapers happening during the whole 1970s. Now, what's happening industrial here is this. Until this time, computers had been used for support functions. As far as I can think, this is the first time in which news, uh, computers were used as the core of a business. That is, the product of the business was produced on the newspaper. All of the interactions between the people in that business, and these are not computer people, none of them are, take place on that system. Okay? It is the heart of the newspaper. It's made more difficult by the fact that at the time, nobody in the newspaper how, knew how one was produced. The technology in place had been in place for two generations before anybody came to work for that newspaper. Um, and so you were trying to automate something that, in which everyone knows if I do my job at this point, somehow magically the paper appears. No one even knows how much wire service copy comes into the paper. No one knows anything about quantifying anything. And you've got to automate this. The, um, and all the users are non-technical people, very non-technical people. The story earlier about typewriters being thrown out Portland Oregonian, when they first brought typewriters into the building, on the Monday after they brought them in, they were all found smashed at the bottom of the stairways. Okay. <laughs> These are not people who are very, uh, very eager to embrace technology. The, the system has to be instantly responsive, because you're on deadline, and it has to be fail safe. <coughs> if you go down, you don't produce a newspaper that day. You can't lose copy, you can't go down. And you're going to be doing this with early 1970s computer technology, which Richard can talk about. So this is a real, real technical challenge. What you are doing is you're producing a newspaper that has newspaper text in it, but the text is laid out on a page, and it's written and edited to fit that page, to fit its, the news hole on the page. 
You are managing news budgets. You are moving stories between different people and taking track of who's made editing changes and who hasn't. And so there's a whole management process here. You are capturing classified ads at the ad taker sitting with a headset, ta taking the ad in. Uh, and as they're doing it, you are having to justify those, pay those, 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 those things so you can tell someone how many lines it is and therefore how much they're going to charge for it and do the full charging and billing on it. And then you have to, and you have a whole other section of people who produce display ads, which are very complex combination of text and graphics. Uh, and you've got people who laid the pages out, which means drawing boxes and knowing how things are going to go on the page and flowing the text copy into it. So it is a complete system, a, a, a complete package under really difficult industrial strength uh, uh, constraints. A big newspaper system will be 200 terminals. Okay. Response times of more than two seconds are totally unacceptable. Okay. On deadline, everybody's working. In fact, uh, for the system, they, uh, system that was installed that I, a client of mine at the Washington Star newspaper, we gamed that thing for election night. And all the specs were for election night uh, because we knew that'd be the heaviest load time. And we went and we measured it and we met those specs. Uh, but, but that was what it had, that system had to be built for that. Um, and just some idea of the progress that was made here, and this is a, not newspaper, but it's a parallel sort of thing. So we know what perspective we're doing. Um, 1975, US News and World Report was doing complete pages without pictures in place, transmitting electronically to printing plants. 1977, they were doing that with the pictures in place. So from 77 on, every, every news page of US News and Report, everything on that page was being produced in Washington, DC on their ATEX system and transmitted to RCA video comps. This is triple I, excuse me, triple I video comps to be set in pages uh, and on film that weren't right to play. Jonathan, this yeah, is a technology I, thing. So what are the technologies that made that possible? Okay, let's, let's have the guys here who were. <laughs> Before we plunge into that, I'd just like to make one comment. Um, the application that I can think of from the 70s that is most similar to what you have just described is airline reservations. There's some obvious major differences, but there's a great many similarities, and it would be very interesting to do a compare and contrast. Uh, what now? Airline, airline reservations. Oh, okay. Airline yeah. reservations. <laughs> Online airline reservation systems. <laughs> um, I would say same requirements for fault tolerance, same complete dependency of the business on yep. it. Yep. Um, all, all those things are yep. the same. Of course, many of the graphics-related things are totally different. Yeah. Yep. His comment about it being the first core system, I would argue with at some time, because we did build things like airlines. But let's stay with this on the technology. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Paul, do you want to start, or do you want to start, Richard? I, I'll start, and then. So I'm 25 years old. I just got my master's degree in journalism. I walk into the Minneapolis Tribune, and they give me an assignment, which is to automate all the pre-press functions. I was 25 years old, and you have a budget now for the next five years of one to three million dollars to spend on technology that will automate this paper. And oh, by the way, there's the composing room up there. They're represented by the International Typographic Union, which has 123 people. And when you're finished, there'll be 21 of them left. We have to negotiate an agreement with them. You don't touch anything in the composing room because if you do, you may find your fingers bleeding because they're going to come down with a pike stick, strip, pike stick on it, a metal piece of metal <laughs> on, your, on your fingers. So that is the environment. And it had, as Jonathan said, every what they said at the Minneapolis Tribune to me when I got there was every minute that we're late on the distribution is $7,000 downstream. So every minute that you can't produce that paper is $7,000 on your head, and you're going to be held accountable for it. <laughs> and I'm 25 years old walking into this. So over the course of five years, we automated the entire newspaper, uh, negotiated the agreement with the International Typographic Union. But this had nothing to do with any of this happening out in California. I mean, you, you guys had this world there. We had this practical thing of how do we move these people and the technologies together so we formed a joint group of newspapers called the Newspaper Systems Development Group, which a few people even talk about anymore. In those days, I think they spent $60 million with IBM 
Raytheon, Singer, Omnitex, names that you've probably never heard of, to write a functional specification for a fully automated newspaper system, which went nowhere. But what it did was bring together, because the problems with the labor and the people and the resistance to technology were so great in this industry and the requirements technically were so great, we thought we'd get the best people in the world, IBM, to come up with a solution. <laughs> And they just kept writing these documents. But a full system specification was written over a period of about three years. And that's when I came in in 1973. Um, and that was going to be the future of the newspaper industry, independent of anything that was going on here on the West Coast. Um, well, it didn't turn out that way, of course, from a technical point of view. But what it did do was shift the thinking in the newspaper industry that we could work together and accomplish a common specification that wouldn't be unique to each publishing environment i.e. each newspaper, that we could in fact work together as a technical team. We, each newspaper had a member in this group. And we could get vendors to actually produce a comprehensive system, which were, in essence became the ATEX system over time. Um, so it was an interesting um, time, for sure. Um, as a 25-year-old, I, <laughs> I learned a lot in a hurry. Um, and we independently of any of the stuff that you guys were doing, we were doing, as you'll see in these pictures and stuff, all the things you were doing, we were just doing it differently. And Jonathan, and I think that leads well to Richard and Jonathan as to how we went about and created those systems. Richard? Well, I was an old guy uh, when I started the newspaper industry. I was uh, probably 24, 25. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I'll go back a bit into the 60s, I like to, uh, bring up a name that maybe we should look into because I don't know that much about them. I worked for them. Hendrix Electronics back in the mid uh, to not well, the We bought from them. Hmm? We bought from them at Berkeley. Oh, you did? <laughs> that was a nightmare. <laughs> well, maybe those, uh, no, I have nothing to do with it. <laughs> um, it's a Mormon outfit. And that's where the funding uh, came from. It's a lot of publications they uh, put out. And money didn't seem to be an object, and we were giving a lot of money to try out all kinds of new things, like that big disc I mentioned earlier that was in their office. Uh, <clears throat> also, we got to use new technology, like the uh, brand new PDP-8. That was before the 11. And uh, you know, for a guy who just uh, last job was driving a taxi cab, uh, that wasn't too bad to start working for them. So <clears throat> they had the uh, first um, keyboard, I think, uh, computer. It's a graphic, it's a, a vector mm -hmm. screen for uh, generating text. And uh, <clears throat> the intention was actually to give them to the uh, editors, although I, did, I don't know, I don't remember now whether they actually no. accomplished that. No. no. So <clears throat> they also did a lot of, a whole bunch of other things that uh, I wasn't involved in. So, <clears throat> but I want to bring up the name so that if anybody remember anything to add it into the history. Come 1970s, uh, ATEX started work, first of all, with the US News and World Report uh, in the production department for terminals to go in there. We would have been talking about technologies little small parts of the technology that come together, that came together back then to bring up the, uh, the, the infant uh, publishing industry. But I think equally important, I think we should spend some time to look at what, from the other side, the user side, who, who are the users, who were the users, right? who were the companies, and what were their uh, needs? Why did they <coughs> want to automate even? Uh, there was as Paul uh, pointed out, severe uh, hesitancy to not automate. It is not that they you know, don't see the future coming. One of our customers was a uh, uh, government printing office. I went into their, their printing shop, a whole floor, but I would say four times this total area of uh, uh, line casting machines. The walls were gray, battleship gray. 
nice paint until you try to scrape it. It's all lead. Okay, the guy told me that they had more lead on the walls than they have in the uh, little pigs that go into the crucibles, right? they melt it. They lose tons and tons of lead every year. It goes into the air in front of the linotype operators. And OSHA was being organized at that time, and they saw the writings on the wall that they won't be able to have those around. And yet, the union says that we cannot change it, so we have to be creative. What do we do about it? Changing human nature. So at the time, the computers, you know, we all know that, uh, were not quite able to do the uh, uh, job that we wanted to do. We were all trying to, whose term was it, to try to uh, simulate the future, <laughs> to fake, to fake it. We had a, uh, you know, advanced, the most advanced computer, um, that we could afford, the PDP-11, when we started. And that was less than one megahertz. Right? And we knew that we could not give one computer to each terminal. In fact, my uh, <laughs> directive was to, you get one computer, you need to service 30 editors. And the in total intelligence of the terminal was a bare scanning TV. Standard TV, television, uh, you got it to run in non-interlace. So you get what, 400, 500, 512 lines, sending it 60 cycles. But that's it. Generating the characters, uh, doing everything was custom work. Thankfully, I have a brother who is into hardware and did all of the uh, tricks to make that work. But how do you get a one megabit computer one megahertz computer, uh, sorry, with a, what, 64K word, two byte word, addressable space uh, to service all those people. And the OS at the time that was available didn't have a clock in it. So <laughs> you can't do time, uh, time slice. Uh, multi-user. So we have to invent all of those from scratch, go in there and change the computer to make them do a multi-user, multi-task OS. So all of that is not, it, it's what's needed to do, get the job done at a uh, price point that we can actually survive in. And we did. The important thing that the, I think what we uh, learned was that the job is not about, from our perspective, the technology. If we can't give something to the uh, user that is a lot more than what they got out of a typewriter, we can't change the behavior. They will stay with the typewriter. They will stay with hard copy. It is not the typewriter. They need, they want the physical ownership of that paper, of that uh, printed paper typewritten page. So I think that we spent a lot of time trying to give them all of that in the typography, the uh, justification, at least for us in the printout part of it, because we didn't have, we have a monospace uh, terminal uh, and all of the editing features. Uh, I think uh, <coughs> Jonathan pointed out that a lot of those people have no idea uh, what the total workflow we can't tell them that, you know, when you're done, send this to your, type the name in of your editor. We don't know what it is. We never did. And how do you get your copy back to the editor? You see this pointy things? It's a little round lead on the bottom, a, a pin about five inches tall. It's called spike. <laughs> you put your copy on there, and the half boy picks it up and delivers it to it. <laughs> so we need a key called spike. You hit spike, and depending on your sign-off, it knows who gets your uh, copy and how many copies to make. It goes to your editor, it goes to proofreader, legal, it goes to all those people, right? And that's the editorial side. To 
can't make pages without the rest of the stuff. They had two other departments, classify ads and display ad. Right? Classify ad people don't care what it looks like on the screen. Lovely, we don't know how to put WYSIWYG on the screen. Mm -hmm. right? But we can break down the lines, tell you how many lines it is. We call them ad takers. The, the uh, business people in the newspaper don't call them ad takers. They are ad sales. Their job is not to take the ad. Their job is to listen to what you want to do and sell you lines. All right. So if you have three line ad and you run one word over, they say, sir, add a few more words to it. And before you know it, you have one word longer. <laughs> <laughs> you run one day ad. Sir, if you run Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you get Sunday for free. It's included. That's what their job is. It's still today if you call up to take an ad. Right. All of those things have to be in the computer because the cost have to be instantaneously updated so that he can sell. We can't justify a classify ad system based on helping them type faster. There's no money in it. No justification. We have to help them. So classify ads, it's the same thing. All right. okay. Come page maker. Page, page makeup. How do you make up pages? Pages have real estate value. It is not just a, a page. Front page, back page, right? inside page, page next to news. You don't run an ad for United Airlines when there's an air crash, right? You don't run this ad against that. All of those logic have to be in the, uh, in the system. Of course, my job is to say, yes, sir, we'd love to do that, sir, and try not to, to sweep that under the rug until we're actually able to do that. <laughs> we have a system of uh, worked out with Boston Globe, <laughs> where pages have value, real estate, it's like real estate value. So if you have a particular breaking news that you want to stop taking ad, really kicking away ads which they don't want to do, in what priority to you uh, make news, enlarge the uh, news hole? Uh, or if you have somebody who wants to build a big, uh, put in a big ad, okay, shrink the news hole. So the values, things are all put in there. Those are the things that uh, a customer wants to use all of the uh, products we are talking about. You know, a lot of that stuff we never implemented at all <laughs> and uh, may still be in there somewhere. Or somebody has implemented them. Richard, the technologies, yep. you built them yep. and you built product yep. and you ended up dominating the newspaper publishing business entirely with ATEX. Yep. When did your products come out? 1972, we started uh, working with U.S. News and World Report. We had the f got the first check from U.S. News on Thanksgiving Day. That was Thursday. Uh, when did you start building the product? Just about then, because before then we had no money. <laughs> so, so just, just, just a little, little yeah, sort yeah, of help, help personal. Me here. Okay. I gave a speech at the National Computer Conference. Um, after that, and there's a story about microcomputers in there, but I'll see that later. Um, but after that speech, um, this guy from, this fast-talking guy from Alabama, and, <laughs> and, and, Doug uh, Drain. <laughs> okay, Doug Drain, and R Richard's brother, uh, sort of buttonholed me and came, and, and we sat down, we talked for a long time about what they were doing and what they wanted to build. Um, and, at the time, my father was consulting for U.S. News and World Report that had a serious problem in that they were changing printers. Um, and they had a deadline which they were changing printers. And they, the only way they could do this properly was they needed to move the entire magazine to being electronic output, okay, by that deadline. I see. So um, I had, you know, I sort of put my father and U.S. News and World Report together with ATEX and said, you know, of all the people I've talked to, these people look the most promising for doing what you're doing, but they're a startup company. They haven't built anything yet. Uh, so uh, 
uh, as Richard had said earlier, they went up to see ATEX, and they eventually, uh, they wrote a contract with ATEX that had milestones that had to be met, and payments had to be met along the way to make this thing happen. And miracle of miracles, it happened. They got it done in time, and the magazine got produced. Here's what my question was. We've been talking about all the technologies that we're working on at Xerox yeah. Park. You've made the point that the things that led into what became t uh, this really came out of the newspaper work. So what specific technologies was Richard working on? Get the pictures, you can see it, okay? Because, uh, because you the- You really want those pictures, don't you? <laughs> okay, because- You guys want to skip the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what, uh, what they started out with was just doing, for newspapers, just doing the text and it got pasted into the pages. But what they ended up with by the end of the decade was you have a layout terminal with, in, in, in which you have a graphic of the page um, and you have all this news copy coming in from the system that has been pre-justified, a pre hyphen justified, and written and edited to the number of lines it has to be. Um, you've laid a page out and you flow those news stories into that page. You have display ads that were produced on display ad terminals, that graphics, you put them on the page. They built all this software from scratch yes. without and any hardware. other foundation. Yes, and hardware. And hardware. There's all, there's all the required hard hardware. How big a company are we talking about? We, at the end of the decade, uh, 1970s, uh, we were a thousand strong. Where did you, you start with? Hmm? When you guys met, where, how many did you have? How many employees did you have to begin with? Three of you? Three of us? Yeah, that's what I figured. <laughs> they were the most promising to handle the U.S. news report. Three guys in a Blows my mind. But there was no other choice. <laughs> Go it's ahead. pretty amazing, isn't it? And Just a second. How, 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 fast, how long was the deadline? Okay, I was started by saying that the beginning was the July 4, 72 by, uh, mm. sorry, uh, Thanksgiving, July uh, 1972. We delivered the product in live, working, and the first uh, issue mm. was uh, July 4, 73. We had those times to not just write the software, to build the hardware to turn a plain vanilla PDP-11 into a multitasking, multi-user, no edit, there's no display sc screen. You're talking about a TV. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no way you can do that that fast. <laughs> did it. They did. <laughs> Just Liz. stop, Steve. <laughs> stop. Liz. Then, then, you weren't Steve. experienced because otherwise you never would have done it. <laughs> Liz, you had a comment? I'd like to mention Cytex and that. Oh, uh, that's uh, that's for tomorrow. I hope. I mean, we, okay. we, we, we've got. I mean, that's we're getting into the 1980s now, and okay. so it's let, let's not cram, cram the 80s in the 70s. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So our work with the newspaper ahead, systems Paul. group convinced seven of the major metropolitan newspapers, and had 60 million dollars in 1973 that was invested in that specification with IBM. Convinced us it was possible. It's just that IBM, we weren't going to make it. We became convinced they couldn't implement it on an IBM 360. It just was impossible. So we needed some additional technology. So that gave us the confidence and the, and the understanding of the problem to allow us to take something like Richard and uh, Charles and Doug's idea of, of converting a PDP-11 and putting some custom cards in it. Did anyone else do custom cards for PDP-11s? I don't know, but <laughs> anyway, they did. And Thousands of people did. Yeah, but that's how we got there in that time frame. We took advantage of what uh, digital and get yeah. us. Had this uh, great thing called Unibus, one of the first uh, chassis with a uh, standardized bus so we could do all kinds of things uh, with it. That now, Mergenthaler later on in the late 70s is installing systems at large newspapers. Jonathan has told me, of course, they never were the major player in the business. No, the, 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 the major players were ATEX. In the large newspaper systems integrators in Sacramento, um, the large ones, uh, but there were there were there were 24 companies making newspaper systems for newspapers large and small by the end of the 70s. So this is and this is the largest company, but there were 24 of them, um, mostly in the U.S., um, a couple in Europe. Uh, bear in mind the the technological center for all of this was the Boston, New England area, biggest concentration for all the commercial typesetting stuff was not the West Coast, it was the East Coast. So this was a, a world apart, both in terms of what they were doing and also geographically from what was happening here. 
So from the technological standpoint, which of the products that we're going to end up talking about in the 1980s are directly dependent upon the work that was done at ATS? PageMaker. PageMaker. No, I respect uh, the display ad layout terminal. It's called the GT68. I still have the spec. It's, it was 24 pages that basically used the next generation of microcomputer at the end of the 70s. Uh, this GT68 was the 68,000 Mo Motorola because it had the address space that we needed to do the bitmap graphic. And we had that operating at the time that Eastman Kodak purchased the company. Take me the other step. On PostScript, that does not come from the work here. That's a, that is a completely separate genesis. Is that correct? That's right. ATEX uh, is more a commercialization of all the products. The composition uh, software, the actually setting types, uh, well, we borrowed IBM's. Mm -hmm. We added a bit to it, our contribution. And I, I believe that other people have borrowed ours. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the uh, kerning, for example, came from your dad. There's this thing called he has called aesthetic kerning. Yes. <laughs> um, also, the hyphenation di uh, dictionary came from it came from my father, who had, had licensed right. it to U.S. News, who licensed it to you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we we are more um, taking the technology, fundamental technologies that uh, you guys have done, uh, and IBM and digital equipment has a had a typeset ten. Mm -hmm. We borrowed uh, from them. So we're going to see in the 1980s two of the major pieces from the software world. We get the page maker, we get PostScript, we then get frame maker, we get other things that add on, we get the Ventura work that speeds up a lot of the process. But those are the fundamental things plus all the other stuff we've talked about, the laser printer, and the other no. Photoshop. Bots. You get bots. So all those come together. Come together at that time. Interesting, Bert, the interesting thing was that we start out in the 80s, and we'll talk about this tomorrow, with this being personal publishing. By the end of the 80s, what's happened has been the desktop publishing has subsumed these larger commercial systems. And people increasingly are basically building large professional publishing systems around the desktop publishing. Interesting transition. Yep. Well, and then we're going to have to take a break. Well, one other quick comment before the <coughs> is the customers, the reason they could do this in a year is the customers drove it. <laughs> So I was a customer. I was buying an ATEC system, but they didn't have a functional specification for their system. <laughs> so I got on an airplane with one copy editor and a class, of, and we wrote the functional specification. The newspaper wrote the design document for ATEC. Steve, that's the answer to you. How did we get uh, the How did we get the, the product done in such a short time? We skip writing the functional spec, <laughs> <laughs> and when a customer wants it, we say. Well, write it. <laughs> and they told us to write it. We, we, we had writers. We got on airplanes every week, and I flew to Boston from Minneapolis, and we worked for 48 hours, 72 hours straight, into the midnight, writing a functional spec that turned out to be 256 pages of what the ATEC system did. And we what defined all this. What happened to the $60 million dollar IBM spec? Hmm? What happened to the $60 million dollar IBM spec that you told us about earlier? Trash cans. You could have told us that. <laughs> <laughs> but Stop. it was important. It, it convinced the Stop. industry we could do it. Just a minute. Just a minute. But the, John, Jonathan. Okay. Even though it was no good. Okay. Paul Butler. Uh, just a short footnote on these editing systems that we've been discussing, because I grew up this on This is John Markoff. So and and it, uh, sadly, my first one was not Richard's. I, I grew up on an SII system, uh, which was built by one of his competitors on, on the West Coast. And you know, from the point of view of a user, I just wanted to point to Larry's point. The most powerful feature on this system um, that, that, that I had was that the top line of the display was de devoted to messaging. It was basically Twitter before Twitter. <laughs> and the most powerful part of it was its simplicity. You were limited to seven lines, and you could see, but basically everybody just used the first line. And it was such an important collaboration tool. I mean, it was just, <laughs> its simplicity was its usability and its power. And it's what made the system actually really effective for workplace collaboration. Thank you, John. What Paul was what Paul was talking about that's really crucial here. Whether you were a tiny newspaper or a large newspaper, and they bought different kinds of systems and so forth, the buying process was always the same. There was a committee that was formed in the newspaper that was dominated by the editors, but also include the display ad people and the classified ad people, and maybe a business person, but it was dominated by the users. 
and they would select a system by going around, once these things were off the ground, and trying them out. Uh, and what was what the, the paramount thing, yes, it had to produce the newspaper and everything else, and it had to meet the specs and it had to be good price, but the thing that, because the people driving this were the users, how easy it was to use and how natural it felt to them was absolutely crucial in selling the product. Okay, so this was, at the same time this was happening, you were having in the office, you were having word processing systems that were bought by bosses for secretaries to use. It was an entirely different mentality, entirely different focus as far as user interface was concerned. Gentlemen, wait, 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 but just one thing, right? To intervene here as a historian. Go so ahead. we've we've heard the key thing here really is, you know, workflow, right? This isn't an individual system. This is about a whole bunch of people collaborating and it's all very much customized to what newspapers need. But people are going to hear this transcript and they're going to say, we still don't have an idea of how page layout was actually done on it, right? Because we know with PageMake, you pick something up and you move it around. I can reverse engineer from what you've said that there's a graphics display that is frequently updated when changes are made, so you can see what a page will look like. But, but how do you actually lay out pages? Are you putting a bunch of tags in? Can you, is there any kind of pointing device involved? Go look at the pictures and then ask me tomorrow. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah. Right, I mean, we're gonna break for 15, ladies, we're gonna break for 15 minutes.